Okay, this is session number five, Call It Quits Referral Program, Connecting Patients to Tobacco Cessation Services. Our presenters for this session are Brianna Longway and Dr. Gregory Hansen. Uh, Brianna is a tobacco treatment coordinator with the Minnesota Department of Health. Dr. Gregory Hansen is a dentist and an educator from the University of Minnesota. The first half of this session will provide an overview of the Call It Quits Program. Uh, Call It Quits referral program, and the second half will be dedicated for a presentation by Dr. Hansen, highlighting the importance as oral health providers in addressing tobacco use with your patients. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Longway and Dr. Hansen. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Brianna Longway. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, thank you, Katie, for the introduction. Um, so before I get started on my presentation, I wanted to quick do a little housekeeping as far as materials. I brought in a number of materials with me today. Some of them are up front um, in the atrium entrance as well as um, here. Please feel free to take as many as you'd like. There's some wonderful tips resources that, um, that you'll see later on in a slide um, as well as a couple of other pieces of materials that we'll be touching on a little bit later. Um, so without further ado, uh, just briefly, what we're going to go over today is we'll talk a little bit about what the referral program is. It'll kind of be a high-level um, overview of the program, how does it work, and what are the benefits. And then Dr. Hansen will be talking more about the link between oral health and tobacco cessation, and then we'll have some time at the end for any questions. All right, so first and foremost, when I think about tobacco cessation, I like to think about the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that although we're seeing overall declining rates of tobacco use and smoking specifically amongst the population, smoking remains, even today, the leading cause of preventable death and disease in the U.S., killing approximately 6,000 Minnesotans each year. As it turns out, from research and surveys that we've done, most smokers in Minnesota want to quit. According to the 2014 Minnesota Adult Tobacco Survey, but many of them are not motivated to take the first step until it's recommended by a physician. So one thing we like to focus on is that knowledge of most smokers want to quit. And with this program and with you sitting here, we can achieve that. So the trifecta, as I like to call it, is the provider involvement, cessation counseling, which is something that we cover with the referral program and the quit line coaches, as well as medication, including nicotine replacement therapy and prescription drugs. The provider involvement, all of you sitting in this room, they play, you play a very key role in both motivating the patient to quit and in connecting those patients to referral cessation sources. Even with a brief intervention, three to five minutes is all we really say. In fact, um, in this uh, Minnesota Adult Tobacco Survey, smokers cite a physician's advice to quit as an important motivator for attempting to stop smoking. It's one of the top motivators. Again, as we look at cessation counseling, we've seen um, through years and years of evidence that it's very effective in getting people to quit and quit effectively and long term. And again, and in the medication as well. But research shows that the three together is the most effective. And especially when you look at cessation counseling coupled with the nicotine replacement therapy um, with that doctor recommendation. Um, it, research shows that counseling and medication, that dual therapy approach is the most effective way that you can get a patient to quit and quit successfully. So in Minnesota, everyone has access to free cessation support. So in Minnesota, we, we don't have one state quit line. We have multiple quit lines in the state. It's a combination of the uh, health plans in Minnesota and then quit plan service who's, services who are run by Clearway Minnesota. Um, although it, it is a fragmented system, which can lead to many barriers, um, that's why we came up with the Call It Quits Referral Program a number of years ago, it is effective in making sure that all Minnesotans have coverage. So the collaboration, or the, the quit lines came together and formed a collaboration, which I'll go into a little bit more, um, and with the purpose, the sole purpose of um, creating tools and systems from existing resources to increase utilization to tobacco cessation resources. Next slide, please. So as I had touched on briefly, it's a collaborative approach. Um, because the, the system is fragmented, the quit lines in the state came together in 2007 uh, to form the Call It Quits Collaborative. Um, they came together for a number of re reasons to coordinate their services, and out of that um, came the Call It Quits referral program. Tobacco cessation really was rising to the top when they looked across their chronic diseases and their rates among their members. 
So, um, so the program began in 2007, late 2007, 2008. January 1st of this year, the Minnesota Department of Health took over the administrative responsibilities for the program. Um, currently, there are over 1,200 clinics, medical clinics enrolled, including dental offices, primary care, hospitals, um, and behavioral health and public health. Uh, but we, we can do a lot better than that. Um, the Call It Quits Referral Program and MDH, we, with the collaborative members, we're working hard to increase the uh, enrollment of providers and ultimately the referral and enrollment of patients to Quitline Support. And we're, we're looking for quality improvements, so we want to come and present. Uh, this program has been around for eight years, and there might be some in the room that have never heard of it um, or, or don't understand how the quit lines work in our state or the resources that are available to your patients. So we want to expand that provider network. Next slide. So to quickly run over uh, how it works, I keep talking about this program, and you're probably wondering, well, what, what is the program? Um, so, so in a nutshell, the program is a tool for you to use to make the referral process easier. So as I had mentioned, right now there are uh, five major health plans and then Clearway Minnesota, who provides quit plan services to those that are underinsured or uninsured in the state. And, and they work together to take the burden of knowing where your patients need to go based off of their insurance. They take that burden off of you. Um, so, so briefly, looking at this slide, and I apologize if it's a little bit hard to read, um, you as a provider would enroll your clinic into the program you get some materials, you get a welcome email, and you get the referral form with a site ID at the top. So then your portion takes place. You assess the patient's tobacco status and their interest in quitting. Complete that referral form and fax it to our, our central triage entity, who then identifies the appropriate quit line. So as I had said, that burden is taken off of you. Um, on the back end, we decide it's determined where is the appropriate quit line, and that referral is then triaged and sent on to them. And then the really cool part happens, and it's a proactive outreach to the patient. So that quitline coach picks up the phone and gives the patient a call. So rather than having the patient in your office and saying, you have health partner's insurance, this is the number that you need to call, and then letting them leave and hoping that they make that phone call, this proactive approach takes that all away. They reach out to the patient, they introduce them to their services that they have available, and they get that process started. And finally, after that outreach attempt is made, the results are returned back to the clinic so that patient outreach attempt, whether or not they were contacted and enrolled in services, is sent back to your office. Um, so talking about the patient experience, it's, it varies a little bit because the, the different quit plans uh, or quit lines offer different services depending on what their insurance covers. Unfortunately, we don't have one uniform system across the state. But the patient can ex or you can expect your patient and you can tell them that they will have individually tailored calls from a quitline coach. They have an unlimited number of calls into the coach, so inbound calls. They usually have um, about five scheduled calls with a quitline coach, um, but they can call in as many times as they want. And often they'll need to during a time of crisis or a time when they just think they really need a cigarette. Um, they will have program materials. If they, if they choose to enroll, they'll have program materials mailed to their home. They'll have um, prescription counseling. So the, the Quitline coach will discuss the nicotine replacement therapy, some of their options for prescription medication if um, it's indicated that the patient wants that as well as the provider. Um, and then they'll have the, the opportunity for over-the-counter, the, -counter, the um, NRT for f fulfillment. Some of, some of them um, will mail that directly to your home. Uh, or mailed that directly to their home. Otherwise, they'll be able to be connected um, to their pharmacy. So in thinking about you as a provider, the benefits for you is it's a free program. It's, it's free for patients. Um, it's free for you to enroll. There's, there's no cost there's, um, associated for, for either parties. You can make patient referrals with a single fax number, and unfortunately, it is still fax. Um, it's a fax-based system. We haven't moved to electronic yet. We are in the process of doing that, but it, it takes a while. Um, so, but, but it does still make that process easier because it's one number that you have to remember, and then you know that that patient is getting connected and being sent to where they need to go. Um, and you can monitor your patient enrollment. So besides the feedback that's being sent back to your clinic, there's a data portal that um, you have access to upon enrollment that will provide you with your monthly aggregate clinic data for your patients. Uh, all right, so as I had mentioned, that proactive approach, 
it really is key. We're finding that as, as time goes on in tobacco cessation, cessation research that making sure and closing that gap between when the patient leaves your office and you provide them with a number to get the help that they need is essential. So getting them to a, a tool or a referral program that does that and, and takes that burden off of you as the provider and them as the patient to make sure to make that first phone call, which often doesn't happen. Um, and we see that happening in so many other areas of medicine. When you need to go see another specialist, often that referral is done, or that referral process is done without having to put that burden on you as the patient to make that phone call. So we're really, we're really seeing that that proactive approach is key. And, and what better way than a free program for you and for the patient and closing that gap for them. Next slide, please. All right, and so getting into a little bit about doing that brief intervention, as I had mentioned, uh, a key model and a, one that's um, recommended from the clinical practice guidelines for treating tobacco use and dependence are the five A's. And you probably have heard of these or may have heard of these. Um, I do have a resource available for them if you'd like to take, these, uh, take that with you. Um, but we like to think about ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange. So you as the provider do the asking and the advising and the assessing, but then the assisting and the arranging, that's pretty much taken off of your plate, especially the arranging for follow-up. You wanna see that patient back in the clinic, but making sure that they're getting the help is when you make that referral. If they enroll in services, they're getting the help that they need. All right, and so when we're talking about how can I get started, uh, there's five easy steps really. You can go to the site and you register there and as I had said, once it's confirmed, you'll receive um, those materials, but you can start referring patients immediately. So if you have someone in the office that you'd like to refer that day or someone that you know is coming in, uh, you can start right away. There's nothing holding you back. You'll have your referral form emailed in a PDF version to you that, uh, that within one business day. And then additional resources will be mailed which are also available online on our, on our website with the Department of Health. Um, you, again, you can monitor your referrals and there are links to that data reporting site on our website. And then we'll send quarterly updates for you with new tips resources, additional resources, um, evidence base, uh, research articles, things like that that we send out quarterly in a bulletin. Um, so thank you very much and I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Greg Hansen. Thanks, Brianna. You guys are impressive. It's Friday afternoon, it's sunny out, and you're still here. And we're gonna talk about cigarettes. <laughs> so this is impressive that you guys are still here. I am, I'm passionate about this subject, though, and that's why I'm here, and I wanna thank everybody for staying around and listening to this conversation. Um, the title of my presentation is The Two Realities for Oral Health Care Providers Regarding Tobacco Cessation for Patients, What We Know Versus What We Do. That's kind of a mouthful, um, but so is a cigarette. So um, my references are, and Brianna mentioned them, the clinical practice guidelines for treating tobacco use and dependence and this study was done in 2008. It's a fantastic study, but it is about 1,000 pages long. So, um, you know, it's definitely not bedtime reading, but it has a ton of information in it, uh, lots of references, uh, excellent research. It's, it's just a great resource. The other two references are, and Brianna mentioned one of them, the Minnesota Adult Tobacco Survey, which was done in 2014, and then the Minnesota Youth Tobacco Survey, which was also done in 2014. Those are great for data on the state of Minnesota. And then my other reference would be just peer-reviewed journals that uh, I've taken advantage and studied and, are using, and I'm using in the presentation. So, just like to start out by making one comment. Tobacco use is a chronic and addictive behavior with multiple negative health implications Many of them result in death. So that's a very somber way to start a conversation, but that's the truth. Thank you. 
Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what we know. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is what we know about our patients. The first thing is that smokers do go to the dentist. And they go to the dentist, about 50% of the smokers go to the dentist one time a year. And that's really pretty impressive. Um, interestingly enough, we've had over the last several years, since 1999, a real significant decline in the number of smokers in Minnesota, adult smokers that is. It used to be about 22% and now it's down to 14%. So uh, whatever is going on in our environment here in Minnesota, it's having an impact on people that smoke. And it, and it could be our efforts, it could be the price of cigarettes, it could be husband or spouse, wife, whatever, influencing the smoker, lots of different factors, but the number of smokers is declining. But it still is a significant number because that 14% of adults, that's 600,000 people. Um, there also are an additional 200,000 adults that are using smokeless tobacco. So that adds up to 800,000. And then we've got the former smokers. And as I mentioned, smoking is chronic. So former smokers potentially could become smokers again. And we have about 1.2 million of those. So we have 2 million people, adults, in, in the state of Minnesota that have been involved with smoking in their lifetime, either currently or in the past. Um, there seems to be uh, an inverse relationship between smoking and some other factors. One of them is age. As you get older, there's less of a tendency to smoke. Income, as you have more income, there's less tendency to smoke. And education, also the same way. Um, the start date is really interesting. Um, this is something that wasn't intuitive to me, but I found out that the start date for 80% of our smokers is before the age of 18. 31% 31 actu 31 actually start before, uh, between the ages of 12 and 14. And only 5% start after the age of 21. So if you make it to 21, you almost have it made. Um, it's, it, that's a really good thing. But think of that. Think of all those young people that come through your dental office and think of um, remembering to ask the question of those folks as well as, as the adults. We typically don't think of asking young people, but that's where the smokers are starting. Uh, high school, 19% uh, of high school um, people use tobacco. 10% of those high school people are smoking. 6% are using snuff or smokeless tobacco. And here's something very interesting. Keep this in the back of your brain. 12% are using e-cigarettes, okay? That's a huge issue. Uh, e-cigarettes are not tobacco, but they are nicotine. And it's a big issue uh, because there is oftentimes an overlap between the use of e-cigarettes and tobacco. Okay, so that's what we know about our smokers. Next slide. Um, patients trust what we say. Say that to yourself. Patients trust what we say. This is very important. You know, I've practiced dentistry, taking care of patients for 34 years, and sometimes I didn't think they did trust what, they, what I said. But they really do, even though they don't tell you. They may not act on what you're saying to them. They might, may not floss when you tell them to floss, or they might not change their diet when you tell them to change their diet. Or they may not come in twice a year when you tell them, but they trust what you say, especially on health care issues. That's a very important thing to remember. They may not, not always act on it, but they trust what you say. And prompting patients on health care issues results in improved outcomes when you're talking to them about a certain issue. For instance, if you prompt them to discontinue using tobacco, that's going to increase their efforts to quit, and it's also going to increase the quit rate. Next slide. This is also important. Keep this in mind. 70% of smokers want to quit. 70% of smokers want to quit. 54% of them 54% of them have tried to quit in the last year. Many of them try one time. A lot of them try multiple times, up to four, five, six times. 
So that's every other month some people are trying to quit smoking. So, next slide. So we really have an amazingly unique opportunity. We're seeing 50% of the smokers at least once a year. They trust us. 70% want to quit. And just saying that they should quit increases the quit rate. So we, this is just like a perfect environment. Um, there's a, another thing that you can take advantage of in dealing with this issue, and that is something called a small step approach, or Kaizen is another term for it. You may have heard of that. There was a study done in 2011 that demonstrated that gradual reduction in the number of tobacco events per day increases or improves the, the final outcome in an effort to discontinue smoking. Okay, said easily, if you just use one less cigarette a day, you're going to have probably a better outcome than trying to go cold turkey on it. So we can take that and use that to our advantage. Uh, we can also use to our advantage something called motivational intervention. And what that means is having that conversation with the patient. Even if they say, I am not going to quit, you can still have a conversation. And they're not going to be offended by it. And one of the motivational intervention conversations uses the five R's relevances, risks, rewards, roadblocks, and repetition. And it's just a way of entering into their world and looking at it from their viewpoint, having an understanding, but yet still trying to make progress towards a final goal. So small steps is it's just a wonderful way of kind of just doing this gradual thing where you build up the inertia until you finally, until the patient finally does discontinue. Next slide. Okay, this is good. Brianna mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention it again. And if we both mention it, that means it's important. So um, evidence-based research shows that telephone counseling at high intensity, that is the length of the phone call and the number of calls, produces the best outcome of any form of counseling intervention. And that's exactly what Call It Quits is. Telephone counseling, high intensity, produces the best outcomes of any kind of tobacco uh, counseling intervention. It works even better if it's combined with um, medications. And there's basically two types of medications we're talking about, and Brianna mentioned them. Nicotine replacement therapy, and most of those are non-prescription, and then two prescription approaches, Zyban and Chantex. Um, it's important to remember that if you're going to use these, they need to be used appropriately. So every patient is different. Medical histories are different. You can't make a blanket statement that I'm going to use A or B or C no matter who comes in the door. You have to be very careful and make sure you're using the right thing at the right time for the right person. But the combination of those two things really does make a huge difference for patients. The reality is the opposite is happening for tobacco users. 66% of the patients try to stop uh, using tobacco without any medications. And that's even higher when you're younger. Of course, when you're younger, you think you can do anything. So, you know, why not smoke and then try to stop on your own? It, it doesn't work, and most people are finding that to be the case. Only 30% of them use assistance of any form, medicine or counseling. Believe it or not, 45% of them are trying to use e-cigarettes to discontinue smoking. And that's about the worst thing you can do because e-cigarettes have nicotine in them. And the studies have shown, I don't know if you read the latest JADA journal, but studies have shown that this is, is, is not going to work for those people. So e-cigs is not the answer. In fact, it's, it's worse than doing nothing at all. Um, the usage of evidence-based treatment has declined significantly since 2010, and that's very unfortunate. We have these great tools at our, at our chair side, and patients aren't taking advantage of them. In fact, the usage of these has declined by 50%. Even though they're the best tools available, patients aren't using them. So we have a great opportunity here. We have we know what's going to give us the best outcome. Uh, 
We are health care providers that see these patients on a regular basis. They trust us. They want to quit. And sometimes they can do it in small steps. All right. What do we know about our roles? All right. Dental hygienists, dental therapists, and dentists. How did I figure out what is our role? I went to the Board of Dentistry and reviewed what's in that book. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it's about a 150-page book, but they give definitions of what our responsibilities are. Dental hygienists are responsible for educating, providing preventive care, assessing, and counseling, amongst other things. But certainly, that would apply to tobacco cessation, education, and counseling. Uh, dental therapists educate assess disease, formulate treatment plans. Certainly, in that, those, those terms, we certainly have the ability to do tobacco cessation counseling. And for us dentists, diagnose and treat any problems in the mouth, we are certainly responsible for helping our patients with tobacco cessation. So that is our role. What do we know about the harms of tobacco use? Well. Here's a slide, and it doesn't show up very well, but we have some actual brochures and handouts here. And this is a CDC uh, public service announcement. And they're taking advantage of former smokers and ask them to make comments. And what this former smoker is saying with dentures in hand, you think a lot about teeth when you don't have any. And as, as you, I'm sure, know, one of the consequences of smoking is periodontal disease. And one of the risks of periodontal disease is tooth loss. So a uh, consequence of smoking is tooth loss. And that's an unpleasant thought, but it is a reality for smokers. So it has a great deal of impact on both the general health and the oral health. Why don't we go to the next slide? Um, and then is there, can we, yeah, thank you. There are two main elements in tobacco there, uh, that are harmful. One is the nicotine, and the other is tar. Let me just talk a little bit about nicotine first. Nicotine has an impact on a neurotransmitter in the brain called dopamine. And the dopamine is active in the reward and motivation uh, segment of the brain. And um, it's basically the reacting part of the brain versus the thinking part of the brain. So when dopamine is working, you're feeling a euphoria and a relaxation. Nicotine has an impact on the dopamine, and so nicotine gives you that euphoria and relaxation. Nicotine is addictive, both physically and psychologically. Uh, it does cause the release of epinephrine, which uh, has an impact on the sympathetic nervous system, but nicotine is addictive. Nicotine receptors in the, in the brain become less sensitive with time, so you smoke three or four cigarettes a day, and um, that works for a while, but then your brain tells you I need six or seven, and then your brain tells you I need 10 or 12, and then I need a pack, and then I need two packs. That's the way nicotine works because of the nicotine receptors. What are the actual impacts on our body of nicotine? Well, it increases our heart rate, cardiac output, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and for all of those people that are involved with the mouth, the real significant thing is it's a vasoconstrictor. Um, it does make you feel better when you're using nicotine. It reduces your anxiety, and it even increases your uh, skills on certain motor functions. But after that two hours, the nicotine wears off, and then you get that anxiety. You get uh, insomnia, depression, anger. You get hungry. All these things that uh, you maybe were trying to get rid of. Nicotine, the first puff takes 10 seconds for it, affect, for it to affect the brain. So it happens very quickly. Tar, that's the second element. And it's a particulate, and it's made up of a whole bunch of compounds. But there's actually 40 carcinogens in tar. Um, so that's very significant. And as we smoke, that tar penetrates our respiratory system. It paralyzes the cilia in our respiratory system, and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, let me just give you a few facts and figures. The presentation wouldn't be complete without a few facts and figures. Um, tobacco use causes 400,000 deaths in the United States in a given year. 
It's the single greatest cause of preventable deaths in the United States. Brianna mentioned that. So I'm mentioning it, so remember that one. Single greatest cause of preventable death in the United States. 3,200 people start smoking each day. Every year, 8.5 million people become disabled due to smoking. 8.5 million. That is more. That's 1.5 times the population of the state of Minnesota. That's a lot of people disabled. What are they disabled with? Well, the diseases that are caused by smoking are stroke, myocardial infarction, peripheral vascular disease, lung disease. In fact, it causes 85% of the lung cancers that, um, that are around, 85% are caused by smoking. Um, cancer of the esophagus, stomach, pancreas, kidney, colon, bladder, and the cervix. One third of all cancer deaths are due to smoking. The impact on the unborn, that's oftentimes a forgotten thing, but we have to mention it. The impact on the unborn, uh, it does affect brain development, preterm delivery and stillbirths. All of those are very, very serious. It's, it's, an, it's an important thing to remember. We just think about the smoker, but the unborn, that's a very serious and significant issue. Secondhand smoke has the same impact on the recipient of secondhand smoke as the smoker has on himself or herself. The oral conditions, I think there might be another, yeah. Oral conditions, we all know about these. Squamous cell carcinoma, leukoplakia, stomatitis, hairy tongue, wound healing, periodontal disease, wound healing, dry socket risk. Let me just talk a little bit about perio because we're all here as oral health care providers. Nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. And that's how it has the negative impact, because it reduces the blood flow to the tissues surrounding the teeth. And it also reduces our ability to respond to bacterial invasion. So not only does it reduce blood flow, but it impacts how our body deals with infection. It seems to be that it's a function of the number of cigarettes and the duration of the smoking. So the longer you smoke, the more cigarettes, the worse it is. Um, the periodontal research that I did indicates that uh, bone loss rate is increased with tobacco use. I think we all intuitively know that, but it's been proven. Periodontal therapy, especially type 3 and type 4, which are the, the hard ones to treat, those are, have much poorer outcomes with a smoker. Clinical attachment loss and recession are greater with smoker. Uh, Periimplantitis, it used to be back 20 years ago that um, you couldn't put an implant in for a smoker. They've, the, the research has advanced enough to say that that may be not totally the case, but you're really uh, at a high risk of periimplantitis with, uh, with certain types of smokers. Uh, most failures in periodontal therapy are associated with tobacco use. So uh, smoking is not a good thing when you're dealing with periodontal tissues. There is some good news, though. If you stop smoking, a lot of these things are reversed. And that is a great message that you can give to your patient. If they say, it's too late, I've been smoking since I was 13 years old, and I'm 70, it's too late, that's not true. If you stop, you're going to notice some immediate changes. And if you continue stopped, you're going to notice some life-changing changes. Some things you can't change. You can't make lung cancer go away by stopping smoking. But you can do a lot of other positive things. So that's a really important message to give to your patients that are, are chronic users of tobacco of any kind. OK. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is the part of the presentation I didn't want to give, but I have to because it's true. Um, over the last couple years, I've spent some time with the SHIP program inviting dental offices in Bloomington, Richfield, and Edina, and then also in Ramsey County, but I'm going to talk about Bloomington, Richfield, and Edina, to enroll in the Call it Quits program. And a lot of these people, these dentists, were my friends because I practiced in Bloomington, and I'm an older guy, so I know most of them. Um, I was able only to enroll 18 of the 62 offices in this program. I was very disappointed about that. I gave it my best shot, but it just didn't happen. Um, 
this slide does show that this is relatively consistent with the national data. And that national data says that we're not very good at doing what we should be doing. 50% of the dentists talk about tobacco use, 20% discuss strategies, and then only 2% follow up. That, that's actually Minnesota data, not national data. Uh, if you uh, look at the research done at Ohio State, it reports that only 12% of smokers report getting information from their dentists about discontinuing. That's compared to 50% by physicians. And in the third study, um, said that 25% of smokers report that their dentist advised them to quit. Those are awful statistics. That's not good. And the weird thing about it is, most of us, 80% of us dentists, believe that there's a value in advising. So there's just a total disconnect, and it's, it's really, really disappointing. Um, okay, let's go to the next. All right. This, these are all assumptions that I have made based on my conversations with dentists about this issue. I think that there are five barriers. One is time. One is lack of support from their coworkers or their team. One is fear of patient alienation. Another is lack of knowledge. And the final one is our perceived role as a dentist. I think that they're all solvable. I really do. Some of them are solvable in a very easy manner. Others are more complex. But the time and staff support issues, I really think if the dentist has the right vision about what he should be doing as a dentist, I think that should solve it in itself. The second thing is I think you can solve a lot of the other staff support issues or the time issues by sitting down and having staff meetings or having one-to-ones with those people that aren't quite so convinced that this should be part of what they do during a hygiene visit. The patient alienation issue, I think, is resolvable. I already explained that patients trust what we say. They may not act on it, and they may kind of look away when you're telling them to floss once a day or to um, give up that can of pop if they can, and, or at least don't sip on it. You know, they may not, may not give you the right body language, but it, it is entering their brain, and they they do trust what you say. So that alienation piece, which I was constantly getting from my peers in Bloomington and Dinah and Richfield is the reason they didn't want to do this, that's just not true. They aren't alienated. They do not get ticked off at you. They trust you. The lack of knowledge, that is an easy one. I mean, you guys are here, so you've learned more. But all you have to do is pick up journals, read, study, uh, take the time. Uh, read that clinical practice guidelines, a thousand pages, and uh, you know, it's a Russian novel, but it's got great stuff in it. Um, uh, the Minnesota Adult Tobacco Survey, it's got great stuff in it. Uh, really helpful. It, makes, it allows you to understand what's going on around you and gives you a better idea of how you can treat it as a result. The last one, this is the one that bugs me, uh, and I graduated from dental school in 79, so a pretty long time ago. And, um, you know, when we were trained, it was, it was a whole different world. But the dentists coming out now, I've, I truly believe they feel they are oral physicians. And that's what they are. And that's what all dentists are. But a lot of times dentists feel like, and this is kind of a crude term, but tooth and gum carpenters. And that's really not what we are. We are oral physicians, and we need to have that perception of ourselves in order to step forward and deal with this issue with our patients. Because in our heart, we know we should be doing this, but we just aren't getting it done. Okay. So, um, there's two realities. We know what, uh, what we know, or should know at least, and then what we do. I talked about that. We see tobacco users frequently, and they trust us. And most do want to quit and are trying, and sometimes they're doing it in small steps. We can get the best outcomes if we combine two wonderful tools, the Call It Quits program, which on the scale is at the top. It's getting A pluses in any studies that are being done. It's the best. 
and then the use of medications when appropriate as an aid, they combine well together and they give you the very best outcomes. So these tools should be easy to use if we eliminate those barriers. And there are barriers. I mean, we encounter them all the time, but they are very significant in, in this conversation. We need to eliminate them. So we get this ideal environment. We should be able to achieve really good outcomes for our patients. Okay. Next slide. I'm a baseball fan. I don't know if anybody knows who Yogi Berry is. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Yankee catcher, uh, many-time All-Star, MVP, Hall of Famer. But unfortunately, he's more noted for his quotes than his baseball skills. And this says, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. And that sounds really weird. But the truth of it is, when he said this, he was talking about how to get to his house, and there was a fork in the road, but then those two roads merged later on, and so it didn't matter which way you went, left or right, you still got to his house. So it, it's kind of silly, but he meant it well. And so what I, why is this up there? Well, you know, there are two realities for us, too. We can go left and right. We can go the, the way we used to go with what we're doing, or we can go the other way with what we know we should do. And I think if we go the way we know we should go and use all the tools we have, we're going to get one heck of a good outcome for our patients. Thank you.